Thank you very much to the St. Geordie Festival for inviting us to talk to you. My name is Antonia Lloyd-Jones and I'm a translator of Polish literature and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Polish journalist and author Witol Szabłowski. Hello. <laughs> uh, and Witold's going to tell us about his new book, which is out with Penguin Random House in a few days time. It's a work of reportage and it's called How to Feed a Dictator. So, Vitold, the subtitle of your book is Saddam Hussein, Idi Amin, Enver Hoxha, Fidel Castro and Pol Pot through the eyes of their cooks, which gives us a fair idea of what the book is about. But can you please tell us, how on earth did you hit upon the idea of writing about these dictators through, through the experiences of their chefs? And why these particular dictators? Yeah, thank, hello again, Antonia, and thank you for having me in this wonderful festival. <laughs> it's, it's a bit strange circumstances. We are rather used to talking with the audience <laughs> present, but it, it's a great pleasure. And it's, it's a bit awkward, but it's amazing experience. And I will start, I will show you the cover. I have only the Polish cover of the book because of the coronavirus, the American edition haven't arrived yet to Poland. It gets stuck some, somewhere in the post office, but it looks like this. And uh, yeah, indeed, it's uh, six amazing life stories of the chefs that cooked for the dictators. And mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I almost became a chef by myself. When I graduated from the mm -hmm. Warsaw University, I went to Copenhagen. And uh, I found a job, firstly, as a, as a, as a, as a dishwasher uh, or dish cleaner. Yeah, I, I was, I was just, just a bad job in a restaurant. But very quickly, I, I, I was making my kitchen career. And I became a, a chef helper and then like the, the first, like the right hand of the chef in the kitchen. It was, it was a very rapid career, but also a very short one. Like it took me all, all my kitchen experience was like four months, but in the kitchen, working in the kitchen, I understood what an amazing space is that and what amazing people you meet there and what amazing stories you can hear there. And then I became a journalist, then I became a writer, but I kept that in my mind that uh, the chefs are amazing personalities and that they have a great stories to share. And I was just waiting for a good topic to go back to the kitchen and go back to the chefs. And that's how slowly, slowly I go to the idea of finding the, the dictator, the, the chefs that cooked for the dictators. And why these particular dictators? How did you hit upon these five horrors from around the world? It's not easy to find them, so you can't be very picky, to be honest. <laughs> but I was, my main goal was just, I wanted, I didn't want the dictators that nobody knows, you know? I, I want, uh, uh, I wanted dictators that w when you hear a name, a bell is ringing. So uh, I really wanted people that, I really wanted dictators that people know. And, uh, and I wanted dictators that, uh, that made their footprints on the 20th and 21st centuries history. So I wanted two kinds of dictators, like firstly, known, but secondly, important. Like I didn't want someone who, who, who was just regional and known <laughs> regionally. So I, th that was my main goal. And when I began when I began working on this book, I drew a map of the world by myself and I pointed all the places with dictators and I made a plan, uh, like my dream plan, which are the places uh, and dictators that I would like to talk to their chefs. And 
more or less this book is that plan, which is surprising. I, I thought it's a dream plan and it will never happen, but actually the book is a proof that it happened. So how on earth did you find these chefs and were they willing to talk to you? Was anybody too afraid to talk to you? Usually they weren't too happy to talk to me. Like um, cooking for a dictator was always a very tricky job and you really had to be very careful and uh, make your steps very carefully. Otherwise you could have been executed. So from the nature, they are a careful people. And even, you know, the dictators are dead and usually also the regimes are gone. They are still very careful and they not, you know, they are not these kind of personalities that will share their life stories with the first person they meet. So it, the hardest was actually the chef of uh, Saddam Hussein, because since mm -hmm. the American and British invasion to Iraq, he had been hiding uh, and uh, he, he didn't really want to be found. Like he didn't dream about some, you know, weird Polish guy. Uh, finding him and, and making an interview with him. Uh, so firstly, it took me three years to find him, and then it took me another eight months to make him uh, talk to me. But wow. that was extreme. Like, usually it was taking, you know, from six months to a year, and it was always a chain of people and the chain of people of goodwill, because, you know, I would... I couldn't afford going to Cambodia and coming back, going and coming back. So I had to find people who would find the chefs for me and who would make them talk on my behalf. And how did you communicate with them? Did they speak well, English? Or? None of them, none of them. I always needed an interpreter with me, but usually the fixer, I mean, the person who, who went there on my behalf was at the same time was my translator because they were the people who already built the relationship with the chef and it was crucial for the project like they are they are always elderly people and it's very important to build a trust with them especially with people that worked in in such a um, in, in such a place, especially with people who are, you know, surrounded by spies, surrounded by politics and food and uh, eating is very important for the dictators because uh, they, and they were picking the chefs very carefully because chef is a potential killer. Chef is the guy who, who is feeding you, but at the same time, mm -hmm. he, he might potentially poison you. So everything with the chefs with the dictator's chefs is based on trust so uh, it it wasn't easy to build this kind of relationship mm. but now my, but I... now it works but now it works right before the coronavirus began i was in cuba and i was there for for other reasons but the, for example the ex chef of fidel castro invited me for fishing and for barbecue with him so we spent a two, two beautiful days <laughs> In, in Havana, in his place. Excellent. And did you find out what the favorite foods of the dictators were? Are you going to betray to us any of the recipes? Yeah, well, the, the book is uh, is a bit, little bit, a recipe book. It's, of course, it's mainly reportage and storytelling and, and history book. But as you, as you know very well, uh, there are recipes and um, for example, there is an amazing recipe which which everybody loves. The recipe for the favorite soup of Saddam Hussein. It's called uh, the soup of uh, Tikrit's thieves because Saddam was from a family of uh, thieves from the uh, from the town called Tikrit and the Tikrit had its own species of fishes and they, they are making delicious soup, which contain the, the recipe contains tomatoes, onions, but also raisins and, uh, and the fish. And you can make it actually with almost any kind of fish and you can make it at home. So it's a great coronavirus recipe, I believe. 
I wanted, after translating this book, I want to try um, the Iraqi fish dish, mazgu, which sounds wonderful, baked fish. And I wanted to try Enver Hodja's favorite dessert, which is called shekepare, is that right? No yeah. Albanian. Um, but um, as the translator of this book, I was shocked by these dictators. There are lighter moments in the book, but always underlined with a very sinister touch. And um, I think what horrified me most of all was to find that Pol Pot's chef was a woman who was madly in love with him and who treated him like a kind of rock god. And the vision of Pol Pot through her eyes is just something that blows my mind. So um, I'd like to just read a tiny little bit of the book to give you an idea of how that sounds. Um, so Vitek, would you like to read part of that in Polish for us, just so we can hear what it sounds like in Polish? Just, just before I start, I want to, I want to use this opportunity to thank you, Antonia, for the wonderful translation. I had much better reviews always in English in, in, for my translations. So in America, I had much better reviews than in Poland. And I, I suspect it's because of you. <laughs> I think the what? translation are much better than my work. But our, I, I just want to thank you for, for doing this great job. Well, you make it very easy for me by writing very good books. So um, I'm not going to confess that I changed the whole text and <laughs> wrote a new book. Oh, you, you, yeah. Whenever you say that, I feel that I, I feel that maybe I'm not just <laughs> I'm not too complicated. No, uh, everybody out there, it's a great book. He's written a really good <laughs> book. <laughs> okay, a, a, a piece of Polish. Kiedy po raz pierwszy spotkałam się z bratem Polpotem, za nim mówiłam. Siedziałam w jego bambusowej chacie w środku dżungli, patrzyłam na niego i myślałam. Ależ to przystojny mężczyzna. Ależ mężczyzna. Byłam wtedy bardzo młoda, więc nie dziw się bracie, że myślałam właśnie o tym. The first time I saw brother Pol Pot. I was at a loss for words. I was sitting in his bamboo hut in the middle of the jungle, gazing at him. And I was thinking, what a beautiful man. What a man. I was very young then, so don't be surprised that that's what I was thinking, brother. I was there to report to him on how people were feeling in the villages I'd passed through on my way to his base. And I was waiting for him <coughs> to speak first. But he didn't say anything. Finally, after a long time, he smiled gently at me. And at once I thought, what a beautiful smile he has. What a smile. I couldn't focus on what we were meant to be talking about. Pol Pot was very different from all the men I'd ever met before. We met in the jungle at a top secret base for Ankar, the organization we belonged to. <clears throat> In those days, everyone still called Pol Pot Brother Polk, which in Khmer means mattress. For ages, I wondered why he had such a strange name. I asked several people about it, but no one could tell me. Many months later, one of the comrades explained to me <clears throat> that he was called mattress because he always did his best to calm things down. He was soft and that was his strength. But when other people argued, He'd stand in the middle and help them to reach an agreement. It's true, even his smile was gentle. Pol Pot was pure goodness. Sorry about the frog in my throat there, but you can get an idea of just how Pol Pot's chef viewed him, which is not quite how anybody else did. Um, so, um, Thank you very much, Vitek, for the conversation. And thank you very much to the St. Geordi Festival. <clears throat> and this is really revolutionary to be taking part in a festival that's happening on the go. Well done, everyone organizing it. And the book is called How to Feed a Dictator,
by Witold Shabwowski, translated by me, Antonia Lloyd-Jones. And you can get that online from Penguin Random House's website as a paperback, an ebook, or an audio book. Thank you very much. And thank you. Goodbye, thank everyone. Thank you, Antonia, and thank you, everyone, for watching us.